Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. I am Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. You know, during these history hangouts, we like to bring you some of the fascinating research being done by folks using the historical collections at the Hagley Library. One such scholar is joining me today. Derek Vory Richard is a PhD candidate at the College of William and Mary, and will be discussing his dissertation project titled Industrial Semiotic and Visual Complexes, a study of the United States visual culture from the 1880s to the 1950s. Derek, thanks so much for speaking with me. Happy to be here. So let's dive right in to the big picture. What is your project about? So I'm looking at the ways in which US companies beginning in the late 19th century and throughout the first half of the 20th century were incorporating media of mass reproduction for the first time on a large scale into their business communication practices or their, their business practices. And in doing so, they, what I argue is they created new semiotic and visual complexes that included new modes of visual learning, uh, new forms of readability, and the new cultural position of the spectator. And so when I say that uh, U.S. companies such as National Cash Register Company and DuPont and General Motors were incorporating mass media into their business practices, um, here I'm thinking of in the later 19th century, um, stereopticons, uh, magic lanterns and glass slides, uh, electric printers that used halftone plates. Um, during this time, uh, flexible film, roll film was, and, and using the dry plate photography method was a very new and exciting thing. And it um, very much sped up the process of, and, and made taking um, photographs and developing them a much more user-friendly process. And so companies such as National Cast Register and DuPont, they created um, in-house photography departments and in-house printing departments. And um, I mean, to kind of go uh, a little broader with that, those different departments extended to creating new organizational structures, uh, new training protocols, new communication relations, uh, the communication relations that were um, internal communication relations and mm -hmm. external communications relations that mm -hmm. did reach out into the public. And in doing so, they changed the uh, semiotic and visual field. Um, if you want me to, I can uh, go into the weeds a little bit on defining semiotics, which is please, a- Please um, do, I was going to ask. Okay, yeah, we, we're going to be getting into um, some theoretical material here, but uh, semiotics is uh, what I would call something like a subfield within the human sciences. Um, I'm a pursuing my PhD in American studies, uh, an interdisciplinary field in the human sciences. So I, I very much embrace um, the semiotic literature. And I would define semiotics. There's a lot of different um, definitions out there, a lot of different ways it's used by scholars. But I would define semiotics as a study of the ways in which communications and experience contribute to forming ideologies, actions, and judgments. Mm -hmm. and, and here it's, it's important to emphasize that when I say communications, I'm thinking very much of, or this is um, a foundational way that I understand semiotics as derived from the American pragmatist from the later 19th century, Charles Sanders Peirce, and the Russian linguist of the uh, first half of the 20th century, Vian Vlashinov, they both understand semiotics as part of a dialogical communication process. So a communication process that is always involving a multiplicity of actors. <clears throat> and within that kind of dialogical communication process, or we could just say um, experience, if we want to use those terms interchangeably, um, within that communication process, uh, are a vast array of um, materialities 
that contribute to forming uh, the ways in which uh, we understand reality. Um, if we wanted to kind of use the more Persian language, Perse as a philosopher was very much understand it in how the uh, collective notions of truth and collective notions of the real are created. Vian Vlashinov was um, more of a, a, a modern thinker, much more of a 20th century thinker, was more interested in the ways in which communication processes contribute to forming ideologies of the capitalist mode of production. So the ways in which we as a culture collectively create and understand the capitalist mode of production. And so semiotics, to kind of apply semiotics to a mode as a mode of analysis would be to analyze the different materialities that are involved within communications and experience. Um, one example that I often like to turn to when I'm trying to explain semiotics is the film studies scholar um, Vivian Sobchak. Her book, uh, Address of the Eye, is a, uh, a work of film theory. And within the Address of the Eye, she uses semiotics to develop a film theory on the relationship, uh, the relationship between the viewer and cinema. And there she's, she argues that the semiotics that are in play within that communication process are semiotics that involve the realms of perception and expression. So perception and expression are some of the materialities of communication. Another realm of materialities of communication are words and language and images. Um, another realm of materialities within communication are, to go back to, to Charles Sanders' purse, is memory. Memory is a sign that we carry with us within different experiences and different communications. So those are just some of the examples of the vast array of materialities of communication. We have the memory sign. We have the perceptions and expressions that our body makes, our body as a sign. And then we have the more um, cultural signs of language that institution use, institutions use, images that institutions use, uh, mm -hmm. words that institutions use. And during this period of that my dissertation covers is a period where institutions are embracing new media to create new kinds of signs that infiltrate their own internal structures and the community or and the culture at large. They're very much like one thing that I kind of arguing that I don't get too caught up on where things begin, but mm. For my dissertation, I think it's convenient to say National Cash Register was very much a, an early pioneer in creating these new semiotics because they would create uh, periodicals and other kinds of print media that would use simple words and concise language. And they would combine simple words with images because and uh, one very plain reason is because the technology was there through something like halftone printing. And so an instructional manual uh, would combine an, an image with very simple words. And the mm -hmm. founder of the company was very explicit in saying that um, we need to be brief and we just need to uh, use images because they're more clear and uh, use very direct and clear language. Um, the founder of National Cash Register, John Henry Patterson, uh, in addition to uh, advocating for a new kind of rhetoric and vernacular, he developed what he called a teach through the eye method of training and communications. And mm -hmm. he, his company would, um, they would develop glass slides and they would use glass slides and magic lanterns to train their salesmen on how to, uh, how to sell cash registers because selling cash registers was a new thing and it required a lot of instruction uh, mm. both towards instructing the salesmen on how to sell a cash register and then instructing merchants across the country on how to use a cash register within their business. And so there's kind of a twofold process here where within the NCR, um, uh, within the NCR's internal company, they would be instructing their salesmen through magic lanterns uh, and through um, educational primers, uh, for example. Um, I can talk about those in a second. But then the other uh, part of this kind of mode of visual education, the NCR salesman would then go and instruct uh, prospective merchants through 
uh, and sometimes the same methods. Later on in the 20th century, they would show prospective merchants uh, motion pictures, um, but they would also show them the same lantern slides and they would distribute the same uh, print media that uh, they were also reading. Mm -hmm. um, if you, uh, since I'm on NCR and I mentioned the primers, uh, a really good example of um, NCR developing this kind of new, new uh, vernacular of simple words and concise language uh, combined with images is that in the 1880s, NCR developed their first educational primer uh, that they would use to teach their salesmen on um, how they should sell a cash register. And when developing the primer, after developing an early draft of the primer, Patterson then took the primer to a Harvard professor of English and asked that this professor revise the primer to make it as, um, as concise as possible, to use mm -hmm. kind of a, um, a plain, simple language as possible. Uh, this notion that this notion that we should um, try to make our writing systems very brief is, I think, a, a, a rather new thing that, that begins to occur in the mm -hmm. end of the 19th century and first half of the 20th century. Why does brevity and um, image richness serve the interest of business? I think it's, it serves the interest of I think perhaps a, a, a better way, or not a better way, but another way to think about that is that mm -hmm. it not only serves the interest of business, but it serves the interest of um, large institutional bodies in the sense that it, it fought images and simple words foster a broader kind of education that allows uh, the media itself to reach more people. Um, mm -hmm. within, within some of like the, uh, within the DuPont magazine, um, you can find, I found examples of uh, DuPont using motion pictures to explain how to uh, use dynamite in farming uh, and, and referring to the use of motion pictures as a kind of mass education. Mm -hmm. This notion of education as being a mass process is um, uh, something I think is very much tied to these new kinds of signs. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a way of very efficiently creating a shared understanding in a large group of people. Exactly, exactly. And, and we could also um, tie this to work in film studies where uh, film studies scholars have looked to the ways in which cinema was being talked about in the early 20th century as a kind of universal language, mm. as images, as being a universal language that can cross, um, that can cross cultural barriers. You've given us a, a bit of a preview of what materials you are looking at in the Hagley collections. Uh, perhaps you could expound on that a little bit more. What collections did you look at? So I looked at I looked at a lot of stuff that was I wanted to try to get into like the internal structures of big companies of this time period. And so I looked at uh, Don, the Donaldson Brown papers and Donaldson Brown was an executive first at DuPont and then at GM. And he was from what I can tell, um, from what I can tell, he was kind of, he seemed like he was kind of a behind the scenes executive where um, he had a close relationship with um, uh, the CEO of uh, General Motors, um, Alfred P. Sloan. And one can find a lot of correspondence uh, within the Donaldson Brown collection on uh, correspondence between Brown and um, Sloan on different ways of organization and different ways of management. Mm. Uh, largely because GM was growing pretty rapidly in the early decades of the 20th century. And um, by 1920, uh, both Sloan and Brown began referring to GM as uh, 
Uh, I think they even cite like 1923 as the year in which GM becomes what they call a quote unquote modern corporation that shifts from a centrally organized organization to a more decentrally organized uh, institution. Hmm. Uh, and within that, they talk about uh, different kinds of, uh, of management policies, different kinds of, of management structures. Um, they talk about the difference between uh, administrative bodies and policy groups, for example. Um, and here, here I should also, uh, to kind of, here I should also point out that this same year that General Motors, uh, according to Sloan and Brown ship becomes a modern corporation, 1923, is the same year that the industrial and sponsored film company, Jam Handy Organization, moves its headquarters from Chicago to Detroit to have a closer relationship with its biggest client, General Motors. And so there is another example of uh, the, the ways in which these growing institutions were very much tied to using um, visual media. Uh, GM had a, um, an, a, a contract with the GM Handy organization. The GM Handy organization made films for General Motors. Um, another collection I looked at uh, was the uh, papers of um, uh, John Raska, who, like Donaldson Brown, moved from uh, working as uh, in, I think he was an executive at du DuPont and then was an executive at um, General Motors. And then eventually he went into politics. Um, uh, at the time, Raskop was a by the 1930s, Raskop was an incredibly wealthy um, American citizen. And uh, unlike Donaldson Brown, hit, the material I looked at didn't have a lot on um, the management and organizational structures of uh, you know, business relations. However, um, some an interesting place uh, or an interesting feature of the Raskow papers were his work with um, the civic infrastructure of that time period. Mm -hmm. uh, he was part of the, I think it was called the Delaware uh, Service Citizens, the Service Citizens of Delaware. I may be getting that name wrong, but it was involved with adult education in the 1920s and uh, in including Americanization programs. So educating mm -hmm. um, American immigrants on uh, learning English, improving literacy rates for uh, the American working class after World War I. And um, he funded and uh, supported these Americanization programs, these uh, vocational education programs. And within those Americanization programs, that's another place where we can see these kind of new semiotic and visual complexes because they too would use motion pictures. They too would use illustrated lectures, they too would use uh, this kind of new vernacular of simple words and combining simple words with images to teach English. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another kind of connection between Americanization programs and uh, American businesses is that, as I said, this uh, industrial and sponsored film company, the Jam Handy Organization, was founded by Jameson Handy in I want to say 1920 or 1921, but before Jameson Handy uh, founded the GM Handy organization, he worked uh, for um, Secretary, uh, um, I think it's Frederick Knight Lane in the uh, Department of Interior making uh, media for Americanization programs. And so Handy, in some ways, Handy goes from making uh, media for Americanization programs to then making media for companies such as General Motors. Yeah, um, let's see what uh, I'm trying to think of. Um, oh, I also looked at the uh, collections on Cinecraft Productions. Yes. Uh, Cinecraft Productions, um, for what I can tell, uh, Hagley, the Hagley um, Museum and Library 
I think has the biggest collection on Cinecraft uh, Productions and Cinecraft Productions like the GM Handy organization is a uh, what was a um, industrial and sponsored film company where they would they would make motion pictures for companies like uh, like DuPont, like General Electric, um, Westinghouse, and Republic Steel. Um, the founder of Cinecraft Productions um, was uh, Ray Cully, who Ray Cully had, I believe, he his highest level of education was uh, an eighth grade education, and then. Um, he eventually found his way out in Hollywood and he was involved in um, working on films in Hollywood uh, before he then got into making industrial films and then uh, moved to Cleveland where Cinecraft Productions began. Um, I point out his uh, level of education because um, Ray Cully uh, and the founder of um, the Jam Handy organization, Jameson Handy, shared a, uh, a similar distaste for the contemporary uh, modes of education and schooling systems uh, within American culture at that time. And Jameson Handy very much was advocating for, um, as, a, as a student, um, uh, even as a student in college, uh, I believe at the University of Michigan, um, but don't hold me to that very much was advocating at the time for incorporating visual media into education because he believed that visual media was a more efficient form of education and it was a more modern form of education and the kinds of education that he was growing up with uh, were what he thought was outdated. <clears throat> now, when you were doing your research at Hagley, was there a particular source or document that made you really excited or made the light bulbs flash for you? Um, let's see, I was, it's been a few months since I was there. So, oh, I, I will say this, the, mm -hmm. if I can go back to the Donaldson Brown papers, I thought this was really, really telling. In the Donaldson Brown papers, uh, this may have been when he's corresponding with Salone on, uh, organizational methods for this kind of growing decentralized company. Um, him and Salone talk a lot about the role of facts within this organization. So um, GM needs to be a fact-finding organization and we need to use facts. And I think as someone who's always thinking about semiotics, I think this notion of the fact as being a crucial um, data point, being a crucial form of information at this time, I think that very much is part of this kind of new semiotics of um, visual information and new semiotics of, you know, simple words, of combining images and words. Um, to kind of connect this with National Cash Register Company, um, John Henry Patterson would uh, often when he was um, talking or orating to uh, his salesman, he would always have a big flip chart with him. And on that flip chart, he could uh, draw very quickly um, you know, stats and figures or, um, or uh, the company would often use graphs, like using graphs as a new form of information to convey this kind of factual information. As these institutions throughout the first half of the 20th century are growing, as American, uh, American culture is uh, becoming, um, or is acclimating to uh, growing institutions, um, uh, I think facts take on a new kind of salience within the culture. What sort of implications did this development have for perhaps the rest of the 20th century, perhaps even into the 21st? Put another way, um, has, did this corporate turn toward um, uh, creating semiotic and visual complexes um, have lasting impacts on American culture, American means of communication? That, that is the, in some ways, that's the big question, isn't mm -hmm. it? 
the implications are. Um, I, I'll say this, what I, an interesting kind of uh, trajectory that mm -hmm. I have found in my research is what I feel like is kind of a split between pre-1930 and post-1930. And it's mm -hmm. this shift in the ways in which image media is used and the kinds of representational forms that are used within the image media. And what I'm seeing is that before 1930, so just for convenience, if we can say from 1900 to 1930, a lot of companies that are using image media are using them in very uh, instructional, very prescriptive, and, and almost very didactive ways. Mm -hmm. um, it, to take the DuPont example of these films on dynamite are very much films that are just explaining and trying to be very straightforward of explaining, this is how you do this. Um, NCR would do the same thing with their glass slides or their um, what we call illustrated lectures. They would have a slide that would say, and that would instruct their salesmen on how to sell registers to merchants. So the first slide would say, first step, call on the merchant. And then it would, the next slide would actually, so the first slide would be a text slide. The next slide would be an image slide that would show an NCR salesman in a merchant store interacting with the merchant behind the counter. And then the, the, the next slide would then be a text slide that would say, whatever the next instruction is, um, you know, talk to merchant about cash register. It would be very didactic and instructional. And I feel like that this is kind of a general trend that occurs up to 1930. And then I'm noticing a shift after 1930 and into the 1930s where the, the image media is shifting away from this kind of straightforward didactic representational form to these linear narratives that have ideological messages behind them that are in, in some ways we could say that they are more politically aggressive. They are trying to be more um, persuasive about the good that the company is doing to American culture. And on the one hand, we could say that this is indicative of uh, the Great Depression in the 1930s and the companies are, um, they're on the ropes. And so they're justifying their, um, they're justifying themselves and their place within American culture when uh, a lot of the public is upset with the companies because of um, the economic conditions of that time. But another reason we could say that the messages themselves have changed to these kind of linear and more ideological um, narratives is because of the advent of sound cinema, combining uh, the sound element with the visual element. And that changes, that changes the narratives that these companies are using. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think to kind of go, if we wanted to kind of extend that into the second half of the 20th century, I would recommend thinking about the ways in which narratives are constructed and the kinds of narratives that companies are telling, telling about themselves mm -hmm. and the increased politicization of uh, narrative creation, narrative construction. I, I think that I think that my dissertation is very interested in the development of American institutions creating for the first time narratives that are in some ways implicitly political, implicitly ideological. And by the time we get to the second half of the 20th century and into the 20th century, those narrative structures perhaps have, have evolved to the point where, or have evolved to some extent to where their politics and ideologies may not be as implicit as they used to be.
especially as these institutions become more acclimated with using media of mass reproduction. Well, Derek, thank you so much for sharing your work. It's really interesting. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. My pleasure. For the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts or more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, why don't you join us online? That's www.hagley.org. Don't be a stranger. <laughs>